everybody. Uh, welcome to the next edition of Tools of the Trade on Product Talk. I'm here today with Leanne Schneider. I'm excited to learn about her experience. Uh, Leanne, welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me today. Yeah. Do you want to start by just tell me a little bit about your role in company? Let's set the context. Sure. Uh, so my name is Leanne Schneider. I'm a product manager at Plum. Um, at Plum, what we do is we use industrial organizational psychology or IO psychology science to assess people's potential. Um, so what, it, what that really means is that um, people who are um, either applying to jobs or employees at a company, um, we assess them to see what kind of jobs they will most thrive in. Oh, interesting. Okay. So is it, I'm assuming it's a lot of your products are assessments? Uh, we have a singular assessment, it calls, it's called the Plum Discovery Survey, um, and we use that for a number of different applications, like being able to fit people into jobs, but then also for development and um, you know, career transition, that kind of thing. Okay, yeah, great. And then tell me a little bit about your role there. Sure. Um, so I'm one of um, two product managers at Plum, and we also have a product operations person and head of product. Um, so basically what I do, I guess what any product manager would do, I help listen um, to you know, our users, our internal stakeholders, and our customers to learn about what types of things they want to see in our product, and then work with our um, engineering and design teams to make it a reality and um, you know, include it in and hopefully make things better for them. Yeah, perfect. And I know... Leanne, you've been a member of our uh, CDH Slack community for a little while now. Yeah. And one of the conversations that's come up quite a bit is, I'm inundated with all these other sources besides customer interviews, whether that's feedback from customer success teams or sales teams or individual customers. And one of the things that you shared is that your team is using Pendo uh, to collect some of those insights. Um, mm -hmm. So I was hoping today you could walk us through um, what you're doing with Pendo and how that works. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it really just started because we were inundated, right? Getting it in meetings, um, getting it over Slack, and we were like, we need some sort of way to automate that or at least streamline it. So um, absolutely, I can share. So yeah, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm first gonna show um, the first, like kind of the public facing side of how we collect feedback, and then I'll show what it actually looks like in Pendo. So this is our application. Um, and when you kind of scroll down at the bottom, we have this widget called Resource Center. So although it looks like this Resource Center is made by Plum, it's actually hosted by Pendo. Um, and when you click on it, you can see there's a bunch of like links to different types of articles about Plum, so you can learn more about it or get the information you need. That's also you know partially um, controlled by Pendo. But the one I'm going to focus on today is share your feedback. So when you and click it, on it, just oh, just yeah. to clarify, so we're looking yeah. at the Plum product. Yes. Who? I know you mentioned that you you do a lot of it, like you have an assessment tool. Yeah. Is it the people that are? using the assessment, not the people taking the assessment that would see this interface? Right, that's a good, that's a really good clarification. So um, this share your feedback is available to our customers. So it's not necessarily, so the widget itself um, looks different depending on, on the user. So um, our typical, like 99% of the people that come in take the assessment to apply for a job and they'd be able to see some of this like Plum Basics or My Plum so they can get information um, and that we can answer their questions. But our clients themselves would be able to see the share your feedback part of it um, and, and they'd be able to click in and provide feedback on their end of things like um, you know, the ones that pay for the service basically. Okay, so like if I'm an employer and I'm using your assessment to exactly. evaluate candidates, this would be the view of like a recruiter or the hiring manager that could come in and see the results of the assessment and then they have access to this ability to give you feedback. Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay, um, and perfect. I should also mention too that, um, you know, our internal stakeholders, you know, they can log into Plum and they provide feedback through the same form as well. So we've introduced ah. to us that, you know, if you have feedback on behalf of a client or just even yourself, please use this forum so we can triage all the pieces of feedback um, through this forum. Okay, yeah, great. So both cust like your, your client customers and yeah. your internal stakeholders have access and can kind of submit feedback. Exactly, because everyone like internally at Plum has their own Plum profile and can go into the app and, and do the exact same thing. Okay, great. 
Cool. So yeah, basically, if they get to that point where they want to make a suggestion, either because they've decided they've seen this, or maybe um, like our customer success rep has said, hey, that's a great suggestion, why don't you provide it through our feedback forum? You can go in there, and then we have like a little form here, just a title, what you're trying to achieve, and what is blocking you from achieving it, and your current workaround. Um, and then a little bit about themselves, so we, we if they want to provide that. Um, and then yeah, they just submit the request, um, and that's what happens on their end. It kind of goes into the black box, and then I could show in a moment, unless you have any questions, kind of what we see on our end. Yeah, let's go, can we go through the questions you're asking again, and tell me a little bit about how you came up with these questions. Sure, so I won't take credit for coming up with these questions because this was done when it was on mat leave, but um, you know, just the idea of um, trying to get at the underlying issue here. Like we don't want people just to say, can you do this for us? And then we have no context for why they even want that. We want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, so that's why what you're trying to achieve and what's blocking you from achieving it and current workout around, this gives us a bit of an idea of like the severity of the issue. Is there even a workaround or are they just dealing with it right now? Um, and then, you know, this information is so that if we want to contact them to do some additional discovery, we have a bit more context of the type of persona of the person that we're contacting. Yeah, I love this. It's almost like you're creating a template to help them give better structured feedback. Exactly. Yeah. And that's for internal stakeholders as well, right? They have given well-meaning feedback, but we want them to dig deeper in that initial request too. Yeah, great. Okay, can we look at what where this goes? Absolutely. Okay. So this is um, inside Pendo. Um, so um, Pendo Feedback is one of the products. We use the insights and guidance, but we also use the feedback portion of it as well. So in here, um, there's a number of views. We usually use the browse view and it just um, lists basically all the pieces of feedback um, oh, here. Um, so you get kind of the, the request name. Um, I can go into the statuses in a moment, but basically as they come in, they just um, come up um, over time um, in this view. And give me a sense of, I think you mentioned you have two product managers at Plum. What's, what's the volume of incoming requests that you're getting? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think when we first introduced this tool, I think it was about three or four years ago now, the volume of requests was like intense. Like we were getting stuff like I would say weekly for, for us that's intense. Um, yeah, yeah. Getting things weekly. I would say it's actually petered out within the last year, I think because either maybe we're doing a better job of addressing things or making our product better, and that might be part of it, just the stage of our growth right now or in the stage of our product. Um, but also like a lot of the requests that we know of um, are already in there and people can upvote them. So that's kind of- Ah, another okay. Um, so you can actually see number of votes here. So some of the features that have come in have a number of votes and for whatever reason we've actioned them or not actioned them uh, after having that decision. But um, I found it's actually petered out. So now we only get things like maybe once a month or so that we have to triage. And the process that we use is that our product operations uh, manager, she has a recurring meeting with us and the, me and the product, other product manager, and we review the requests. Um, on a regular cadence so that we could see, okay, is there anything new coming up or has something that we decided to shelf for now received more upvotes and we need to take a second look at it? Um, or is something maybe more strategically relevant than it was in the past and we, uh, before we said, no, we're not gonna do that right now because it's just not one of our priorities for this quarter, but maybe it is now, so. How, yeah. Do your, um, are the voting, is that all internal or do your customers get the option to vote as well? Our customers can do it. I, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not exactly sure how it works when they see it, when they see it but they can actually go in and upvote, um, you know, different pieces of feedback that they see um, okay. in there. Okay, so they have access to, a, to an interface that's similar to this where they can see all the ideas that came in or the yeah. requests that came in and kind of, and then is there any, um, I can imagine you get duplicates. Is there, when they submit through that form that you showed, does it give feedback that this looks similar to these other things? Um, it doesn't say that, but yeah, that certainly happened in the past. I was just gonna show this merge request. I don't know if you could see that. Um, oh, okay. But basically we've had that in the past where it's like a request or like, oh, we've seen that before. And then you can merge the two requests together. So you're not just getting people upvoting the same thing, but in different worded requests. Yeah, I can imagine this could very quickly, it's almost like a, it's almost like what we see with bug databases where 
you get a lot of duplicates. It ends up like growing over time. We forget to look at it <laughs> until something's urgent. So give me a sense of like, how does this fit in your workflow? How is it, how is it, um, how do you, like, is it, is it hard to manage duplicates? Is it, you said you're now getting like one a month. Just give me a sense for like, this is kind of a terrible question. Give me a sense for how does this fit in your workflow, like in a given quarter? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think because we, um, I believe it's monthly, we um, review the, the request. Um, our product operation manager will, she'll download the results. So you can like download everything in an Excel worksheet and then you can do sorting by, and you could do it here too, like sorting by status um, or how many upvotes there are or time um, as well. And like we basically try and prioritize the ones that are obviously we haven't reviewed yet or maybe have the most votes. Um, and then you can also, you know, just like filter by different statuses. So we'll, we'll get out the one, basically get out the other requests that we don't need to look at because it's already released or we've decided right now it's just not a priority and then try and focus on the main ones because you're right, can, there, there can be a lot of noise and we, we just don't have the time to review every single request um, monthly once again. Yeah. So is, is the idea that like you go into a, a month, you've got maybe a theme in mind and you're just looking for, do we have requests that are relevant to this? Yeah, so I think it's a, like we have two trains of thought when we're looking at this. So um, one that like, of course we have our quarterly priorities and we're thinking, okay, we have a few outcomes we're hoping to reach and we can go back into the feedback and be like, okay, this piece of feedback is related to that. So maybe we need to look in and, you know, I'll just pick one for example. So you can, and you can make them bigger too. So we go into it and we may say, um, look, this person, um, this is an internal person, but this person has submitted this piece of feedback. At the time we didn't follow up on it, but now it's more strategically relevant. This is actually a good person that we can follow up with and ask if they want to do an interview. Um, so we've done that before where it's like, okay, this is a more strategically relevant thing and we're going to follow up with these people and use them as, um, you know, discovery targets. So that's how one has worked, um, one train has worked. Um, and in some cases, new p feedback requests will come in and we'll say, look, it's not related to an outcome we wanna do this quarter. The amount of work involved would just be way too much. And some of that triaging is just figuring out like, look, this would be like a huge amount of work and it's just not relevant right now. So we'll set it to, um, you know, open for voting and see if other people upvoted and we can review it again next time. But then there are some things actually much like this where it's a, you know, a, a small change. Um, we have this concept of um, different cards in our platform. So a job rec card, for example, mm -hmm. is one of these. Um, so in, in those, um, the, the piece of feedback here was um, instead of having to click on specific links on the card, can you just click on the entire card? Uh, this is the thing where we're like, well, that's like, you know, a two point ticket for an engineer, maybe, right? Like, why yeah, wouldn't we just do this, right? It doesn't need to be related to a product outcome, but it would be a delight for our customers to just have a little bit more of a simple experience going on. So in that case, when it's like a smaller thing, then we'll triage it. And in this case, we assign it to a, a designer and they were able to look at it and say, yeah, this would be pretty straightforward to do. And we agree that this is a good idea. So we almost have like two tracks. It's more like the, is this related to a product outcome track? And then we evaluate it and either set it to, um, you know, uh, open for voting um, so we can see if it's upvoted more um, or it's more like the, well, this would be a quick win track. Let's see if we could just fit it in um, to like, or maybe put it into the backlog. And if an engineer has time, they can fit it in um, within the next release. And there's that track too. Um, and then, you know, in that case, we'll set it to building or um, interviewing user users if that's the case. And of course, you know, released when it's eventually released. Yeah, you know what I love about this quick wins track is like, it's so easy to take this ethos of like, customers don't know what they want too far, right? So. Should we be building, just responding to feature requests blindly? Of course not. Yeah. But there are all these little tiny things in, in products that you don't know bother a customer until, they, until you give them an opportunity for them to tell you. And I, I actually, my course platform does this. They, um, every quarter they release like 50 to 100 little changes that were all driven by customer feedback. And I love it. 
right? Because it's just, it's a way for them to say, we're listening to you. Yeah. These were all easy changes. They're not things that are going to make it onto our roadmap. They're not things that are going to impact an outcome, but they're little delighters. They're like things that remove a little bit of friction here and there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really easy to forget. Sometimes teeny tiny changes go a really long way for having happy customers. Yeah, I completely agree. And you know, there's a sense of satisfaction too. It's like often we do need to say for certain requests here, like, you know what, it's just not now or, oh, this would take like a full quarter to do and like, it's just not going to happen. But like, there are a few things where it could feel like, yeah, you know what, we can show that we're listening and um, you can have that sense of satisfaction or, you know, maybe it'll take me like a week or so to do a little bit of discovery to figure it out. And it would be like a two week initiative and we can just get it all shaped up and ready to go for when there's a little bit of a lag on the team and they can just work on it. Um, so I do find a lot of these type of requests end up doing that or we just find it's a good source of people if we need to do broader discovery on bigger initiatives. Yeah, that's great. That's that the this idea of like now we also have this kind of back, like non urgent backlog for when somebody yeah. has downtime, they can just grab something um, and kind of improve something for a customer is, is also a really great idea. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, do you when you change the status on one of these requests, yep. does the person who submitted it get an update about that? They do. Um, I don't want to actually do it because actually, yeah. you know, I think if I, uh, let me see, this is a more of an internal. Yeah, yeah, here you can see. So um, if you click on a different status there, we have these like pre-baked messages that have been written by a member of the product team. Um, and you can customize the response if you want to. Um, and then you can choose whether or not to email the, the people who have submitted it or upvoted it to, so okay. that they know that it's being actioned in a certain way. So you have a way to like if the customer submits a request and it ends up getting moved to that build category, yeah. you can let them know like, hey, we're building your idea. Exactly. And it's nice, too, because um, instead of having to spend time in internal channels like Slack messaging this person or that person saying, hey, let this client know that we're doing this. It's just all automated for us. So that, yeah, that that's great. Nice yeah. OK. And then tell me, a little. I know we're a little bit tight on time. Tell me a little bit about um, what impact has this had? What impact is having this set up? What impact does it have on kind of your um, work as a product manager? Um, you know, I, I maybe will be a little selfish in res my response and saying that now I'm not getting random Slack messages saying like, hey, here's a piece of feedback or like during a meeting, we're not surprised with a random piece of feedback and like that are well meaning, but it's like you're almost left kind of um, having to defend yourself in a meeting and having to explain it or um, ask questions about it. Instead, there's like a process now where it's like, that's a great piece of feedback. Can you submit it here so that we can review it and consider it and talk about it as a team? So in that sense, it's a big relief and uh, we're not kind of left dealing with ad hoc requests like that. Um, and I think from a, you know, shipping product perspective, it's nice because we, if we decide that we're going in a certain direction and we need to figure out who to talk to, well, we have an avenue where we can see, have there been any requests about this? Are there people there who upvoted it that we can talk to and get in touch with? Because their, you know, their email addresses are right there. We could just get in touch with them. Of course, we might need to talk through our customer teams before contacting some people. Um, um, there's either that or like we were talking about earlier, you might just have those quick wins that we can do and really feel like, when we've shipped a release that we're doing a good mix of like long-term initiatives that um, we're making progress on that, but just some of the quick stuff um, that we feel like we're making the typical user happy or a typical internal person happy that something that they asked for is, is getting actioned. Um, so it's nice to have a bit of a balance of both. Yeah, that's great. And I love this idea of like, you're not constantly getting peppered because there's a place for the feedback yeah. to go. Um, exactly. That's yeah, this I think years ago um, we I worked at a company where we used to have like an, an internal idea management tool and it just did this. It was the same thing like yeah. every it was a way for people to feel heard. They could visibly see the status of it. People could vote it up and down. We could decide as a team what we wanted to invest in and what we were going to table for later. Um, and I think that kind of transparency just goes a long way for we can never do all the feature requests, yeah. right? But it goes a long way for kind of creating some transparency around it. Yeah, I agree. So that's been the biggest benefit for sure. That's great. All right, well, Leanne, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story. I really appreciate it. No problem, happy to do it.